gives me great pleasure, and please join me in a big welcome for Naif El Matawa, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. This is an amazing event, and this, this, this talk is about the mistakes I made along the way. Some of you know about the successes because of the media, um, and, um, but no success comes without failures. They say, they say uh, overnight success takes years in the making. And this definitely took many years. I started this just under eight years ago. Um, and it's been a long journey, lots of ups and downs, and some of which I'll share with you. My career as a writer started back in the mid-90s. I graduated from Tufts University, came back home to Kuwait, only to find that somebody had just been fired from their job because of their religion. But the worst part was that the person that fired him gave out leaflets to the local community apologizing that had he known this guy's religion, he wouldn't have hired him to begin with. I was wondering what planet I had just landed on and wrote about it in the newspapers, but that didn't hit the spot for me. And so I wrote and illustrated my first book. And the book was about, it was, was for me, it was a book for adults because it was about diversity and accepting people's differences. But then I won an award from UNESCO for children's literature, which was interesting, and I didn't know how to take that, but I took it. Uh, but basically, the, the concept is very simple. It's about a land called Bouncy Land, where everybody was round. In that society, they judged you based on two values, how high you bounce and how fast you roll. But the main... Very simple, right? The main character is born as a half circle, can't do either, he's ostracized, they make fun of him, his parents are ashamed, until the very end, his difference ends up saving everybody and forces society to reevaluate the importance of diversity. So it's about everybody's story, somebody's different religion, different, you know, different race, different color, whatever you want, right? So, but I wrote it, you know, at that time, I wrote about the things going on in Rwanda and Yugoslavia and the guy who got fired for his religion, and then I get this kid's award. So I took it, but this is how I learned, this is my first entrepreneurial journey, because basically I tried to find a publisher, couldn't find one, so I became, I think, the first children's book in the world to be financed by a real estate ad. Um, but that's how I learned the business. I wrote, I illustrated, and I can't draw. My circles look like triangles, but you know, I did the, did the best I could under the budget I had. Book one did great, I got a three book contract. Book two was about Bouncy Jr. going to a land called Rainbow Land, where he expects acceptance because everybody's a half circle like him, but they don't accept him because in Rainbow Land, they don't judge you according to those different things. They judge you according to the color of your bow tie and where it is on the rainbow. So red is better than orange, better than yellow, all the way down to violet, the worst place in society. And people with, you know, and just like any good society, they have marriage laws, right? So anybody with a red bow tie can't marry anybody with a blue ribbon because what does red and blue give you? Purple, the last place on the rainbow. Right? So about cross-religious, cross-ethnic marriages, etc. And so he asked them why they live their life in that way, and he points, they point up at the sky, at the rainbow, and, says, and say it's a natural order of things. And, and he says, what about now, by pointing at the reflection of the rainbow and the river, and what's on top is now on the bottom. And he shows them that nobody's better than anybody based on that. That book did great. Book three got stopped, and it got stopped because of a mistake I made. In book three, I wrote for the day my son Hamid was born. I have him the father of five boys. The first one was born in 1997. And I wrote it for him, Basically, Bouncy Jr. sees a picture of his dad next to a character ten times the size of his father. But that character also wears a necktie, not a bow tie. So there's new, two new constructs I'm introducing here, size and tie. And Bouncy Jr. wants to go to this place, they go, and from, for some reason, nobody knows why, but all the Thailanders are now the same size as the Bouncy Landers. But they have, because they have a law that they can't buy new ties, they have to wear the ties of their fathers, their ties are now disproportionate to their body size. So when they roll, their ties get under them, make them slow and inefficient. And when they bounce, their ties cover their eyes, they don't know where they're going to land, and those that take off their tie in protest get shunned to a different part of the island. And so he asked to see this law, and the law says you must wear of the ties of your father. So they get every tie in town, every tailor in town, and from the same material, they cut out new ties to better serve their modern day needs. So I get asked point blank, this is about the Quran, isn't it? And I said, huh? You know, I said, these books are designed to reflect the reader's soul. Do you think people reading this in Washington or Tokyo are going to think Quran? If I had just changed a few things in that, it would have gotten through, but I wouldn't do it. I was too proud. I was 27 and I quit writing for five years. Cut to a couple years after that. I went to graduate school, did my doctorate, trained at Bellevue Hospital Survivors of Torture Program. And in that process, I was doing my doctorate and I, and I, and I had this issue with my dissertation. I couldn't, I couldn't quite get it passed in the beginning. And you know, I had to make some changes and again, I was kind of resistant. And, you know, the problem basically is I had a big ego, okay? My responsibility. But it had to get cut down to size, and it got cut down to size. Basically in 2000, a couple of friends and I 
started a company here called Amwal. And this is the first time I talk publicly about this. This happened 10 years ago. And one of them is actually here somewhere in the audience. But basically, I, they took me under their wing. There's a Harvard, a, a Harvard MBA, a lawyer educated at Duke who uh, worked at White and Case. And there was the master's level psychologist. You know, you could see the value I added to a financial services uh, company. But I learned, I you know, was involved in the, in, the, in the business plan, raising the money, and, um, and kind of was like, you know, what do you mean? You know, when I was involved in kind of writing that, I, I kind of resisted, like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm a writer, of course the way I write is okay. And, and I kind of learned, you know, beginning to, to kind of um, understand that, you know, one person can't do everything. And it's, you know, it's, people learn that at different stages of their lives. I happen to kind of learn it, I guess, a bit late or a bit early, depending on who you are. But, that, but basically that... That, that, um, I did that for a few months, and then, and then we, basically one of us, because of the amount of money we raised, one of us had to go. And uh, they always like, no, I'll go, I'll go. And I'm thinking, you know, Harvard, Duke, lawyer, banker, financial services, I'm the one going here. And so I used that experience and leveraged it to get into business school. And my failure essay for business school was about how I couldn't get that third book published. My ego was reduced. Okay. Cigarette. So Columbia Business School. Believe it or not, that picture is the start of the 99. And it's the start of the 99 because when my first son was born, my wife wanted to take the, this, these herbs that they take in Kuwait when women give birth called, um, called Hilba. And so she sent me off to the market to go buy this stuff. And I go, and the guy who was putting the herbs into the bag had a spoon and a cigarette here and the spoon is the other way. And as he was putting the helba in the bag, you know, it was like one part helba, two parts ashes. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, you're not going to take this. And of course, I lost that argument. But I thought, you know, what if this was a branded Western product type thing that had the ingredients? Would I have an issue with it? And the answer was no. And so in business school, I developed a business plan to get into the Islamic nutraceutical market. And actually, it's a, it's a, it's a project that my brother-in-law is now running with. He's here, Dr. Faisal al-Rafai. Uh, is here kind of, you know, trying to test out if this, if this you know, project you know, has merit. But basically, that's how it started. But what happened is that in the GCC, you can't really create product, you know, just kind of market it and have a, just be a, a white label company for a product like this. You have to actually own the plant. In 2003, when I graduated business school, the U.S. had just invaded Iraq. The idea of raising money for something in, in, uh, in Kuwait during that time didn't make sense if, if it wasn't kind of IP or transportable. So I abandoned that idea. I literally am in a cab now, two weeks after business school. And um, my, my, uh, my sister, who wanted me, has, has been you know, nagging me about going back into writing for kids, and I kept avoiding it. That's not, you know, but in the cab ride, where I was going from Edgware Road to Harrods, which is a pilgrimage every Kuwaiti makes once in their lifetime. <laughs> And in that cab ride, my sister turned to me and said, Naya, if you told me after school you'd go back to writing and I'd illustrate, she's actually very talented. And I said, yeah, I remember telling you that. And I'm thinking, you know, I just, I just did three master's degrees and a doctorate. I, to go back to writing for kids when I didn't intend to writing for kids from the begin with, that's just, it's crazy. So I, and I couldn't tell her to shut up, my mom was there. So I said, Samad, for me to go back now, it's gotta be something that has the potential of Pokemon, otherwise it just doesn't make sense. So she shut up. And I started free associate. I said Pokemon. My next thought was there had been a fatwa issued against Pokemon, banning in some, part of, some parts of the Islamic world. This is, this is fact, right? My next thought was, my God, what has happened to Islam? And, and, and who are these people making these decisions for my children? My next thought was of Allah and how disappointed he must be. My next thought was that Allah had 99 attributes. And ironically, by the time I got to Harrods, I came full circle back to Pokemon. And I came out of the cab with the beginning with the spark for the 99 idea, basically, you know, characters, 99 attributes, and that was the very, very beginning. And I developed a pitch for the investors, and the, invest the pitch went like this. I said, if you look at the superheroes that exist in the world today, there are two groups, the group that comes out of North America and the group that comes out of Japan. The ones that come out of North America are all based on Judeo-Christian archetypes. So like the prophets, all the, parent all the superheroes are missing parents. Superman's parents die on Krypton. Batman's parents die at the age of six in Gotham City. Spider-Man is raised by his aunt and uncle. And all of them, like the prophets, get a message delivered from above through a messenger. The prophets get it from God through Gabriel, but Peter Parker's in Manhattan taking a photograph when the spider descends from above and gives him his message through a bite. 
Batman's in his bedroom, or Bruce Wayne's in his bedroom, and a bat flies over his head, and he sees it as an omen to become Batman. Superman's not only sent from another planet, or the heavens, but he's sent in a pod to new parents, like Moses was on the Nile, and you hear the voice of his father saying to earth, I have sent to you my only son. Right? That's Jesus Christ from the Bible. And the reason this is done is because there's a Western conspiracy. I'm kidding. <laughs> the reason this is done is because stories, the way that we tell stories is something that's archetypical, something we grow up with. So, you know, when we, you know, the Bible is relevant to a, a billion people in the world. And so when you build the new stories, you build it on older architecture. So you take Waterworld, for example. Who here saw Waterworld, the movie with Kevin Costner? Waterworld is Genesis from the Bible, right? In the Bible, man starts in heaven because of, polar, because of pollution. <laughs> yeah. Man starts in heaven because of greed or the apple. Man ends up on earth, spends the rest of his time trying to get back to heaven. Some believe it exists, some don't. But those that believe it exists believe the way back is through, the, you know, the Bible proves it exists, and the way back is through the child Jesus. You go back to Waterworld, man starts on dry land, but because the polar ice caps melt because of greed or the apple, he's now on He's now in Waterworld, and he spends the rest of his time trying to get back to dry land. Who remembers the book that they used for proof in the movie that dry land existed? Who remembers what the Bible was in dry land? It was a copy of National Geographic. Okay? And who remembers the way back to dry land? Where was the map? I'll give you a hint. It was a tattoo. The back of a little girl or a child, Jesus Christ, right? So, so Hollywood, sometimes it's deep like that. Sometimes it's very shallow, like in the movie The Net with Sandra Bullock. The good person's name was Angela. The bad guy was Devlin. Very deep, right? <laughs> But the concept, I'll explain it to you first and then talk to you about the kind of setbacks and the mistakes that I made along the way. The concept very, to the investors is this. Basically, no, you know, these, are, these, are, is, these are archetypes, but the stories, the Batman, the Superman, the water world, there's no religion in them. There's no religion in the storylines. But if the Bible is the greatest story ever told, the Quran surely is the greatest story most told. Right? There are a lot more Muslims, and there are people who grow up with these archetypes, but there's a way to extract, met, extract stories that base on those archetypes that work for human beings, but do it in a way that combines all of humanity. Just the same way Batman and Superman do. Those aren't just Western messages. Like when, when my son learns from Spider-Man that with great power comes great responsibility, that's not a Western message, that's a human message. So what are those global values that tie us all together? That was the thinking. So basically, the concept goes like this. It's a story that everybody growing up in this part of the world knows. So in 1258, people who grew up here, when the, when the Mongols invaded Baghdad, what happened to the books in Dar al-Hikmah library? Who, who, knows this, who knows the story? What happened? Some got burned, and the rest? And the river, and what happened to the river? Changed color. I rewrote that story, because something that we hear too often is, we used to be, we used to be, the Muslims used to, I call, I call that you know, the story of Al-Bundi, who, you know, the, the shoes, the shoe salesman and married with children, you know, he used to play football in high school. What about now? So the idea here in my version of history is that this doesn't happen. So when the Mongols come to invade Baghdad and the books get thrown on the Tigris, the librarians had actually come up with a solution to save the books through, through an alchemical solution where the stones would get mixed in the, in the solution and they would extract all the knowledge. But the Mongols get there first, the books get dumped with this solution. So when the librarians escape, they dip the stones into the river and suck up all that information that we think is lost to civilization. Those stones have been smuggled, so, but basically, take a step back before I talk about the smuggling, is basically, at that time, those books weren't just Muslim books, they were Muslim books, and Jewish books, and Christian books, and Buddhist books, and Greek philosophers, because at that time, the, the caliph who set up the library, Ma'mun ibn Harun Rashid, had told his advisors, translate any book you can get your hands onto, and I'll give you its weight in gold. After a while, his advisors complained, they said, Your Highness, the scholars are cheating. They're writing a bigger handwriting to take more gold. To which he said, let them be, because what they're giving us is worth a lot more than what we're paying them. So, these, so, the, so the stones which end up powering the 99 have within them the wisdom of all civilizations. They get smuggled into Andalusia and Spain, where they're safe for 200 years. But in 1492, two important things happen in the world. The first is the fall of Grenada, which is important in the Muslim world. The second is Columbus finds the US, or North America. So we go back to my story. 33 of the stones are smuggled onto the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, and are spread in the New World. 33 go on the Silk Road to China, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, and 33 are spread between Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And now it's 2010, and we have 99 heroes from 99 different countries. They're from North America, and South America, and the Middle East, and Europe, and Africa, and it democratizes the superhero concept, because here it doesn't matter where you're from, or you know, what colors you're wearing. The, you know, the characters aren't red, white, and blue, like Spider-Man and, and Superman are. The, the idea here is that you have characters from all over the world that based on which attribute you have and working in teams of three, that's what's going to dictate whether or not you're suitable to solve a particular problem. So it's about problem solving. 
So that's the concept, and I, and I, and, uh, I promised the investors that this wasn't going to be another made in fifth world country production. This was going to be Superman, or it wasn't worth my time or their money. First round investment, mistake number one. Mistake number one is that I could have closed the first round. I, I raised seven million dollars in the first round, and and the and uh, and basically the, the, the money came million dollars came from my classmates in business school, which is why I have investors from the U.S., Mexico, China, Lebanon, Egypt. I tell people of all my accomplishments, the one I'm proudest of is I'm the only person from the Gulf who went to Beirut and Egypt and actually came out with money. Never been done before. <laughs> But I, I, I had, what I needed was three to four million dollars. And the main, but, but I didn't have any financial institution. I was looking for somebody, you know, for that person, that, that institution that could do the stuff that I thought needed to get done. I, because, because, because I kind of, the more I kind of learned, the more I learned that I didn't know anything. I just, I went the, in the other direction. You know, I put my ego aside too much. And, and here, basically, I end up, you know, being pressured, they wanted me to raise five million dinars because typically companies here they raise a lot more money and then they take that money and put in things that they have no business putting it in. And I didn't want that. I only needed one, and in the end, I compromised to take two million dinars or seven million dollars. That was mistake number one. It was mistake, and, and it was mistake number one because basically, what ended up happening is pressure. And but but before I talk about pressure, let me tell you about what we developed with that money and show you how half of that. Not only was it not necessary, but it was mistakenly invested, okay, and caused problems. So, so let's introduce you to some of the 99 characters. So in this while, I knew it was going to be a process to create the characters. It wasn't going to be an overnight thing. It was going to take time. So we have characters. When they first get their stones, they all use it for personal benefit. So Mujiba is able to answer any question in those books. But when she first gets the stone, she uses it to go on game shows and make money, okay. Eventually, she learns to use it for, pos- for more positive things. Jabbar who's from Saudi, uses his muscles, he starts destroying things because he can in the beginning. This was a fun one to name, Mumita. One of the, the 99 attributes have a yin and a yang. There's the powerful, the hegemonist, the strong. There's also the kind, the merciful. And I thought, you know, am I going to have the girls kind and merciful and the guys, you know, all destructive? And I said, you know what? I've met a few girls in my lifetime who are destroyers, so <laughs> Mumita is going to stay a girl. Baqi from Egypt, Musawura from Ghana, uh, Buaseh from India, Nura from the Emirates, who uses light. And this is one of my favorite, one of the 99 attributes is al-Batana, or the hidden. So Batana is hidden, but she's a superhero. And I came home to my wife, and I said, I created a character after you. She said, show me. So I showed her Batana. She said, that's not me. I said, look at the eyes. They're your eyes. <laughs> so my investors, in the beginning, were, you know, it was, now I had raised the money before the boom. But the boom happened. Everybody was putting money in everything. So I, I got pressure to invest the money in either, you know, Kuwait Stock Exchange and Kuwait Real Estate. Showing a picture of the panic when the stock exchange died. The good news is I resisted that and it was not a fun few months in, you know, in terms of, in terms of the, the backs and forth about why I wouldn't do it. The bad news is I felt the pressure and so I felt, you know what, I need to use this money for other stuff, not just creating the 99. So, as a compromise, which I shouldn't have made, I basically went in to translate, did deals with Marvel, DC Comics, and Archie Comics to take their comic books and create the Arabic version and put them out in the market. Okay? So we, we, we basically we did that um, for a couple of years and thought we had a publishing business. We didn't. The other mistake I made is that basically I dropped the ball. Because what happened is because we had done these, we had done this stuff that the money wasn't intended for. Obviously, the money burned faster. I had to look money for the second round much faster, which I shouldn't have put myself in that position of. But that's what happened. I took my eye off the ball. This is issue four of the 99. You know, the, the stories that are supposed to be not as violent. The guy's teeth are flying out. Right. So that was the Middle East version. When we did the version that launched in other countries, we actually had to clean, I cleaned it up because that's not what was intended. We couldn't change the story, but we could change stuff like blood and teeth flying. That was my mistake. Another mistake I made, which is the most major mistake of all for me, is writing has been what I was, I've always been about. I told my parents when I was nine, when I grew up, I was going to be a writer. They said it was a great hobby. You know, but it's always been something that drove me. But, but what happened basically is when I started, started this, I was writing it. You know? And people, you know, people who worked with me were like, you know, you're, the writing is great, those are great ideas. But guess what? I was writing their paychecks. Right? 
Of course they're the great ideas. And it's amazing how much better the stories got when I stopped writing them. So that's another mistake I made, you know. I, I mistook kind of my position for what, and, that, and these are, and thank, I mean, thank God these are problems that, that weren't, not only were not repeated later, but, but, but when, when these kinds of issues of conflict arose, we were able to kind of, you know, nip them from the very beginning. You might have heard about the 99 from the press. We've been covering over 15,000 articles so far. And, and the, the, the story there also is not, it's, 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 more, it's luck. Um, basically, I was, I was here in Dubai early December 2005 trying to find a journalist to write about our story. I had no product, but I had a story. And I, and I found somebody who's now the editor-in-chief of the National, Hassan Fattah, who I didn't know at the time, was a good friend now. And I cornered him and I pitched him and I think I scared him because he promised to write, up, write us up without, without any product. And he's, but he said, you know, Islam and cartoon is not a timely story. Could be next week, could be next month, I don't know when. So I gave it a, you know, I, I let it go. I called him up in a month, and I sincerely said, Happy New Year. He said, Thank you, we just had a baby. I said, Congratulations. When's the article coming out? He said, Islam and cartoon is not timely knife. Well, a few days after that, the world erupted in the Danish cartoon controversy. I became timely. Flurry of emails of the New York Times. Next thing you knew, they do a full page on us. January 22nd, 2006, we changed this product forever. Because not, what happens, anybody Googling Islam and cartoon and Islam and comic, guess what they got? They got us. And that led to just an unbelievable, unbelievable coverage, which helped us go to the second round of investment. And that round was too little. So this is like the three little bears. Too much, too little. Too little because we basically were raising $25 million in the second round of investment. We knew what we wanted. We knew how it was gonna, what we wanted to use it for. But because of bad decisions I had made, including the Arabic comics, we ended up burning cash too early, needing money too early, and needing to accept offers fast. And so we were, we were, lucky, to have, we were lucky to have some, but, you, but we basically closed on a round of, of 15 when we were raising, raising 25, okay? And, and, uh, and this was, again, another, another mistake that I made. Had I not, had I just listened to myself and trusted myself instead of, you know, sometimes it's easy to kind of let other people make the decisions and pressure you because you kind of feel like it's their responsibility then if things don't go wrong. But, you know, newsflash, it's always your responsibility. And fun story, this unicorn, um, you know, I'm, my, my boys love what I do. I mean, comic books, they're boys, superheroes. And I was on the phone with Unicorn when we were doing their investment. And I said, you know, Unicorn said this, Unicorn said that. I don't know, I'm going to have dinner with Unicorn later. Faisal, who was five times, ten now, comes to me, big brown eyes. He said, Baba? I said, what? He said, you talk to unicorns too? <laughs> the 99 have been licensed in eight languages. We're out in China, Turkey, Indonesia. I've uh, done deals in India and Hindi, Urdu, and English. Uh, which you see there is the mobile version in Chinese. I'm hoping that doesn't say, look at those Arabs, they think they can do animation too. Um, <laughs> but basically, you know, that is question number one. Is what we have something that can be transferable into other cultures and other places? The answer is yes. How do we know? We've been able to do it in different markets. Okay? Question two that we have to have answered is basically, is this something as an IP that's transferable into other platforms, not just into uh, comic books? Answer is yes. Frankie, if you can run that. The 99 Village Theme Park ran, uh, opened in Kuwait a year and a half ago through a license. Uh, basically, it's 300,000 square feet, 20 rides. It's in the most conservative area of Kuwait. And there up on the walls are superheroes from India and Philippines and, and Pakistan. And, and, you know, and the kids are learning vicariously of kind of people having various superhero abilities. It doesn't matter where they're from. Um, and learning vicariously, hopefully, that this is a good thing. But don't tell them that I'm sending subliminal messaging. That's us up on the wall. And it's very simple, you know, we basically rebranded an existing park. They're happy because comparing the year before to the year after we came in, their foot traffic is up 101% and their revenue is up 58%. So they're happy with us and, you know, hopefully when the economy recovers, maybe we'll do more, maybe we won't, but that's, that was a good thing for us. You know, is this something that can go into consumer goods? We did two deals in Spain and in Turkey. Basically, we, uh, these products, these are all products that people bought from us licensed to do. But the biggest deal we've done to date is one with Endemol. Endemol are the largest TV producers in the world. They're the ones behind Big Brother, Star Academy, Deal or No Deal, Fear Factor. It's the first time in their history they end up being involved in something they don't own. We created, we did a three-year TV series. Uh, first one has been completed, 26 episodes. It's in 3D CGI, it's in HD format. And when it comes out on TV, it's gonna set the bar on TV animation globally. And I tell people, you know, the days of being the first one in Kuwait and the tallest one in Bahrain are over. 
because there's nothing that stops us here from being able to achieve something that has global ramifications. Um, one of, the, one of the many ways I've been able to avoid future mistakes is through, is through mentors. This is, I'll, give, I'll give you an example here, but there's, you know, some, I've, I've, been, you know, I've had the privilege of being mentored by a few people here at Fadi Ghandur for the last five years who actually sent me to Abraj when I first started raising money and, uh, and I got a reply from Abraj at that time. It wasn't for them you know, too early. I went to Abraj in the second round and, and uh, it was too late. <laughs> uh, um, no, Abraj, Abraj wasn't happy with the business model. They, they said there is no publishing business and I, you know, I defended that and, I, and they were right and I was wrong. Um, I've been, I think that's the second time I've been wrong in my life. But, uh, but I'm going to show you a clip of the animation. But before I do, my, one of my mentors whose name I, I, I can't mention yet um, a big, you know, Hollywood person who has been for three and a half years has given me, I can call him any time, he's given me advice over breakfast, I know because I hear the cornflakes crunching at eight in the morning, but, but he helped me negotiate all my deals, doesn't take a penny from us. But this deal he helped negotiate as well, and, and you know, if not for him, we would have been in situations where we would have had problems. And that's one way kind of that I've been able to offset, you know, some of my personal mistakes or, or you know, before they actually happened was by reaching out to mentors who knew more. So I'm going to show you a quick clip of the animation here. Frankie, if you can play that. Lights off, please. And by the way, this is downloaded off the internet and it's compressed, so this is not how it's going to look when it comes out, but it's, it gives you an idea. Can you kill the lights, please? Or is it, is it okay? Can you guys see? You can see? Yeah, okay, I can't. Go ahead. You're getting good at this. Mostly because you're so predictable. Predictable? Yeah. It's always right, right, left with you. Right, right, left. Them all. Theme park opens, comic books are out in eight languages. I can relax, right? I can invest some of my personal money in something and not worry. So I decide, you know what? My mentor, my psychology mentor at the time, uh, somebody who for 25 years had been seeing patients for free in Kuwait, why? Because he could and because he cared. And for the 15 years I knew him, he tried to change psychology in Kuwait basically by trying to push laws. And I went to him three years ago and I said, Dr. Jafar, this is not going to change through laws. This is going to change to putting it a nice center, qualified people, and charging the same, the same, the same stuff that the people in the bodegas are charging. Because basically in Kuwait, it's not the Ministry of Commerce that licenses you as a psychologist. Sorry, it's not the Ministry of Health, it's the Ministry of Commerce that licenses you as a psychologist. And so I, so I co-invested with Dr. Jafar and op and to open the Sewer Center, which launched in Kuwait in the last two years, already served thousands of people, but Dr. Jafar never lived to see it open. And I found myself in the middle of another startup alone, in the middle of Tashkil. Big mistake. Big, big mistake. Although it didn't cost Tashkil time, it cost me time with my family. And uh, so, so basically, the, the, I'm very proud of what we've been able to launch in Kuwait. I have 22 therapists there now. Um, all kinds of things, all kinds of issues. It's been cash flow positive for almost a year. It's doing fine. We were able to see Clients free of charge in the, in, in the memory of Dr. Jafar. Big mistake. Anyway. Thanks. So I, I, uh, I promised my investors this was not going to be another Made in Fifth World Country production. This was going to be Superman or wasn't worth my time or their money. But how do you know that you achieve that? How do you measure? You measure basically, um, when, when, when President Obama, back in February 2009, it was rumored that he was going to speak in, speak in front of the Muslim countries, nobody knew when or where, I went to DC Comics. 
and I, and I met with the president then, Paul Levitz. He'd been following my essay writing. I write essays uh, that get published in the U.S. And I said, Paul, if ever there's a time to do the, uh, something together, now's the time. And knowing full well the last time they did something with another group of characters was 20 years prior with Marvel and, and Spider-Man. And I'd only been around three years. Actually, yeah, less than three years at the time. And, uh, but Paul loved the idea. And uh, basically, we announced, two weeks after the president spoke from Cairo, we announced a new comic book series where Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and the rest of the Justice League got together with the 99. <clears throat> and, and the first book actually launched October 2007. That's the cover of book one that came out. And the, basically, you have two groups of superheroes that you know, start off distrusting each other, but fully understanding that when there's distrust, the bad guys win and move over to trust. And, and you know, I'm very proud that my characters are standing cape to shoulder with those, sho with those characters that I wanted to emulate to begin with. And, and, and um, I'm very proud also that in April, President Obama called this crossover the most innovative response to his Cairo speech. And he you know, sp spoke for a couple minutes during that, uh, during the, uh, out of, you know, I, t I timed it out, 14 minutes, spent two minutes on the 99, that's one seventh. Um, but, I, but I sat there and he, you know, he, he, I was next to Arif Naghvi and Fadi Ghandour and, you know, and uh, at the, at the summit, and, and the, he, he, he you know, asked where I was, and I heard my name, and I, I put my hand up. I didn't know what to do. And, and, uh, and then he talked about the crossover and, and, and said that he heard that you know, the 99 and, and the Justice League were, doing, were making progress. So that, that part was covered in the media. The part that only, was only covered in Dubai, actually, he came by and shook our hands and said, um, you know, everybody had copies of the 99 except me. Why would I have any? I have so many at home. You know, everybody was, you know. So, so I, I, he said, I, I want some comic books. And I said, I'd love to, but I, I don't have any. And so, and so Fadi leans over, grabs them from under Arif's chair, and puts them into the hands of the president. And the president's like this. You know, he, 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 he's not supposed to take them, but he, nobody's near him. So he takes them out of respect, which is amazing. But what was more amazing for me is the next day, you know, how Aramex took advantage of this, because you saw in the media, Aramex delivers into the hands of the president. <laughs> If ever there was a one-two by Arif and Fadi, that was just amazing. <laughs> Another mistake that some, you know, one day I'll be, I hope to, to be able to overcome is I, I sometimes confuse procrastination with research. You know, I feel like a hamster on a wheel sometimes. And, and, and basically this is, this is an artifact of what happened last year because I was just working, <laughs> uh, you know, and... and, and um, you know, between the, you know, the various things that I was, you know, basically what, what happened is, you know, when you, when you kind of, you know, the human mind is, is it, 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 you know, if you go through a trauma, you sometimes kind of, that bandwidth gets used up in the trauma and you can't, you can't, you, you need to kind of fill it up with other stuff to kind of make the trauma go away. Well, this wasn't really trauma, but it was a lot of work. And when you're kind of working so long for, for too much, it's hard to cut back because you, you kind of stretched, you know, and so, this is something that, that I'm personally working on. And these are my five boys, um, and these are, which you can't, I can't really see. I don't know if you can see them. But this is you know, an important part, you know, b before I end the presentation in a couple of minutes, I, I'm, uh, a couple more slides, and I'll be showing you a full episode of the 99 Animated Series. Um, but this is what it's all about in the, in, in the beginning and in the end. This is, you know, I, you chose seven and a half years ago to use my training as a psychologist to work on the perception of Islam to Muslims themselves. Because I believe that it's only when you're at peace with yourself that you can have better relationships with other people. I think trying to go to the other people right at the beginning just sets you up. And so I, you know, I chose basically to, you know, one of the messages I send out to Western audiences, and I guess this is mostly Western here, or half Western maybe, or went to American schools, and you know, how many of you have read The Catcher in the Rye? How many of you have killed in the name of that book? Nobody? There's at least one usually. Jim, I think, was the one that usually, there you go, Jim, Jim's killed in the name of that book. But basically, the Catch in the Rye is a book that Mark David Chapman was holding December 8, 1980, 30 years ago, when he shot and killed John Lennon. And a year later, when, when John Hinckley tried to kill President Reagan, he too had to refer to the same book. Both of them said that book drove them one to kill, one to almost kill. And my question to audiences is, whose fault is that, the book or the person that pulled out their own messaging? Right? So this is the, the idea I, I reinforce because, I, you know, because of my kids, because of other people's kids, I believe if you tell a kid enough times they're stupid, they're going to believe they're stupid. And if you tell them enough times that they're a terrorist, they're going to start believing that too. And so I, I, my, my thing was, if I can go back to the same place and p provide you know, positive messaging through the use of media, you know, theme parks and animation and toys and, and stuff, that's, I mean, the storylines are not religious. You're going to see a full episode now to, to, for yourself. 
No, it's just human values that we all share with each other. That's the only way to solve this problem from, from my perspective. There's, so I've shared with you kind of the successes and the, and, and, and the problems and setbacks that I went through the past few years. This is the original, what Jim Hornthal was talking about in his presentation, the napkin business plan. That's my napkin business plan for almost eight years ago. That's it. It's on the back of a Howard Johnson's menu. On the other side was fried egg, a picture of fried eggs and a you know, piece of bacon and, and the stuff. And, um, but this is the idea. You know, I would do the, the 99, do you know, Archie equivalent, which was, you know, and, and, and I, when I met with the owners of Archie, I said to them, I, I said, at the time, this is, in 97, I said, 2007, I said, you know, I have this vision for a Muslim Archie, you know, and uh, one of them got nervous. He said, Muslim, Muslim Archie, how would that work? It's like one word. And, <laughs> and I said, well, for 65 years, Archie's been trying to choose between Betty and Veronica. <laughs> I said, let him get married to both and let's move on to new storylines. <laughs> And his jaw dropped, and I kept a straight face, you know. <laughs> but eventually I smiled. But that and the mistakes has turned into an organization that has 700 people under it right now, 20 full time, the rest through JVs and associations. But this is what the, what the company looks like now. Um, you know, you, you, oh, the first person I went to, Larry DeRocher, when I had the idea, Larry was a publisher of Rolling Stone and other stuff. He's been a mentor for me, to me for over 20 years, and he's somebody who can tell me when I'm doing the wrong thing without worrying. He's been my editor for 20 years, and if you can be somebody's editor, you can do anything to that person. And I'm very tough to edit. I don't like it when you change my words. I eventually give in. But he's somebody who can really tell me when to stop and how to stop. Frankie was here in the audience, the first person I, I, um, I, I hired as part of Tashkil. He actually left an investment bank. How crazy is that? <laughs> to come work with us. I showed him pictures and idea, and, and you know, he bought in and left his job. And, Basically, you know, I, I also tell my investors that the only person crazier than me was them seven and a half years ago. I mean, I, I came to them saying, I'm going to build this thing out of Kuwait. I'm going to build this on Islamic archetypes. It's going to have this, you know, global impact. And they put money in it. So I don't know how, I don't know how sane that was. But, um, but that's what we look like now. Uh, these are the various people, both part-time and full-time. Um, 700 people, you know, on five continents building this thing out. And um, third round of investment. We're hoping the amount now is just right. Um, we've raised roughly 30% of it. And we're back on Abraj's table. So if you guys have your little navigator piece things here, put in there Arif Naghvi, put in there you know, Tom Speechley, put in there whoever from Abraj. And when you see him and find them, push him. <laughs> OK? Because the, the past three years, we've been on track. Everything, we exactly know what our expenditures are now. We've learned. We've made our mistakes. We're now ready for the growth capital. And I hope with your support and what you see now as the animated series, the first episode, that you, you, you would have further impetus to push them. I'm going to show you a, a, a episode right now, just so you know, it's 20 minutes long. Um, and after that, I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much.